podcast, Dennis Mortensen, CEO and co-founder of X.AI, talks about his journey of building an AI startup. Welcome everyone to Future of Data podcast. Today we have with us an amazing guest, uh, Dennis Mortensen, uh, a brief bio. So Dennis is the CEO and co-founder of X.AI. Uh, Dennis is an expert in leveraging data to solve uh, enterprise use cases and a serial entrepreneur who has successfully exited several companies on that theme. His long-term vision of killing the inbox uh, led to formation of X.AI and the creation of Amy and Andrew, artificial intelligence assistants who schedule meetings. Uh, he speaks frequently to anyone who will listen uh, from the crowds uh, of Web Summit to his building's doorman about an optimistic future of AI productivity and the future of work. Uh, Dennis has also um, an accredited as associate analytics instructor at the University of British Columbia and the author of Data Driven Insights on collecting and analyzing digital data. With that, Dennis, welcome to the podcast. Thanks much for having me. It's, I think it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating privilege to have you on the podcast. And, and I'll, I'll go over that. Uh, first, let's, let's talk about your journey. I think you, ha you had an amazing entrepreneurial journey creating some interesting work on analytics side of things. And why don't you walk us through that? There's obviously multiple schools of thought around entrepreneurship, but there's certainly the idea that you should start something because you have a passion for it and you simply can't see the world exist without this being in place. Mm. So you quit your job and go work on that. And I think that is an admirable way of looking at entrepreneurship. I might be of a different opinion, which is that entrepreneurship could also be a lifelong career, not a small moment in time for where you stumble into something and you did it for a few years and perhaps you win the lottery, but most times you don't. If you think of entrepreneurship as a lifelong career, then you can almost compare it to that of an investor, right? So pick any VC fund, they will invest in, depending on the fund, 15, 20 some odd companies over a very short period of time, which they can do it in parallel. What we do as entrepreneurs, if we do it as a lifelong career, is that we can perhaps do eight, 10 ventures in our lifetime. So we don't run the four year fund, we run the 50 year fund, and we have to do them back to back. I'm now 23 years in, I'm on my fifth venture, I spent my whole life on it, and I'm certainly naive enough to believe that I think I'm slightly better today than I were when I was 22 years old. And that's my viewpoint, and I think if more people were at least just willing to entertain the idea that I go take my CS degree or whatever type of degree you take, and right out of school, my ambition is to be an entrepreneur, not a backup plan, not a one day I might, as in, that's what I want. What career would you then put in place? And if you know it's a lifelong career, you can also just accept the fact that I might actually do multiple ventures, mm -hmm. pretty much many of the first ones that won't pan out, and that is okay. Just like the professional investor, he assumes of that 15 to 20, that the vast majority goes belly up. If you also accept that as an entrepreneur, then it's just really the way the game is played. You spend a couple of years, it didn't work out as you'd hoped for, you're a little bit smarter, you do another one, you spend another couple of years, you might have some middle of the road kind of outcome and then you just perfect that skill so that at some point you're almost an expert and you can increase the probability of successful outcomes. So. That's a very long story of me trying to kind of say that I believe in lifelong entrepreneurship and that's kind of what I'm pursuing. Interesting. And, and, and what, what brought you to your first startup? Like what was that mindset that say, okay, let me take the plunge in, in this, this sort of risky road? Here's the funny story, which is that 
it's very easy to kind of craft a narrative on the other side. Mm -hmm. You look back and say, what happened? Then I craft a narrative that kind of fits kind of all the things that happened. But hand on heart, if I really kind of tell you why I started an, as an entrepreneur, it might not rhyme immediately with what I just told you. So I took a CS degree in school. I funded my college studies by doing game development, did that for about half a decade back when most of what you engineered you would do in either machine code or assembly and all of the good things that comes along with programming today just didn't exist and i find that whole period super romantic but you know that's a different story i said having memorized all of the clock cycles of each of the kind of instructions on the 386 processor that is what you would do back then but the company which i worked for uh, and I've worked for it on that last uh, title for almost a year and a half. And many times the way you pay students is that you pay them on delivery because mm. they're a little bit uh, flaky. And the company simply went uh, bankrupt. And I was just so disappointed, mad, really, that my whole kind of plan of making a little bit of money on this last title, pay off whatever tiny debt that I had put in place. Remember, I come from Scandinavia, so mm. school is free, right? Mm. And then they went bankrupt. So I ended up having my counsel go buy the rights to the software. And this was back when lawyers really, really didn't know much about software. They wanted to kind of sell me tables and leases and monitors and computers and what have you. And all I wanted to buy was just two CDs with some software. So I bought that for next to nothing. And the company refinanced, came back, found out I bought all the assets. And I ended up selling it back to the company, made back then what I thought was a small fortune. In 2018 money, probably not much. But if you're a young student, mm -hmm. anything above $10 is a small fortune, right? <laughs> so I made a small fortune and immediately thought, you know what? Easy come, easy go. How about I take all of that, do a venture, and I don't count that first thing really as a venture. That was really just being a good salesperson for a uh, moment in time. I'll take all that money, plow it into my first venture, lose it, and then go get a job. Hmm. And this was June 1st, 96 and i invested it into a analytics web analytics company so back then you didn't really have the traditional kind of javascript pixel tracking as you and i kind of know today it was mostly based on web server log files hmm. and you get only so much information out of a set of log files or so really most organizations wouldn't even look at those log files they would just kind of sit there laden on a set of web servers and built up a company around that, bootstrapped it, took no financing, ran it for a good four plus years to a team of about 70 people and sold it in April of 2000. So right at the mm. top of the dot-com boom. And I wish I could tell you that I've seen the future. I haven't seen anything. It just seemed like a good day to kind of call it quits. And in that exit, given that we didn't have any investors, mm -hmm. we really just had me and my friends, we had a very good financial outcome. And that was my first venture. And I thought, now that we're at it, let's take some of the winnings and put it back into the next one. And before you know it, 23 years later, you're on your fifth venture. We'll resume after a short break. This part of the podcast is brought to you by First Friday Fair, fastest AI-powered way to find your next opportunity. Check out the website firstfridayfair.tao.ai and find your next dream job. Let's get back to the podcast. So, so fascinating story, by the way. I think thank you so much for walking us through that. So. What are some of the some of the key insights across your journey that has really stuck by you, or or you sort of you hold that 
that has helped you uh, in your entrepreneurial journey to be successful there's obviously a million things that uh, we thought were smart but were the complete opposite and plenty of mistakes along the way but there's certainly also a few things for where i think we got it right very early on so all of our ventures have at least tried to latch on to a pain mm-hmm. not to technology not to a solution but to a true and honest pain then we can talk about how we remove it or whether we're even capable of removing it but most pains stay true for a long period of time mm-hmm. and the solutions might change over time but if you're really in that venture or in that game just attacking the pain then you never fall in love with whatever solution or piece of technology that you put in place you fell in love with the pain mm-hmm. and that was perhaps one of those things that we just got so right so early that we kind of guarantee that we didn't fall in love and certainly as technologists it's very easy to fall in love with your technology but that was very right and to this day i tend to be very skeptical when people kind of try to pitch me their venture and it doesn't begin with some version of what pain they're trying to remove and if it's their ability to recognize a face in a set of images at some level of precision and recall that we haven't seen before that's certainly mm. a good academic result mm. but i'm not sure it's a good entrepreneurial endeavor and plenty of people might confuse the two things as in i have a good technology kind of put in place here but that's fine but mm. what pain are you trying to remove so we certainly got that right if i were to pick a second item which we also figured out early on and again reminding people here that there was a thousand things that we didn't get right but the second thing that we certainly got right was the value of data and all of our ventures have had a very robust data backdrop as in there was a set of proprietary data that we owned and on that data set we could see that that would help us remove that pain and we were at the mercy of no one as in we didn't lease the data it was not based on some api or platform output as in we own a piece of data that piece of data is a competitive advantage in removing this particular pain those two have been the backbone of a lifetime of uh, entrepreneurship and to this day even our current venture it's very much the same if we take extra ai really we're in the business of scheduling meetings but if you ask the first 10 people if you walk out your front door right now one do you work in an office they say yes two do you schedule meetings that will always be a yes three do you like scheduling meetings the answer will be the uh, friendly version of no i fucking hate it mm. but somehow i'm on it as in there's no escaping it the only way i can escape it really is if i become svp of whatever in 15 years and perhaps mm. i get a human to do it for me but really otherwise it's on me so the pain is real and that's the pain we've latched on to at extra ai which is people just don't like setting up meetings it's not a massive pain it's just yet another chore in my inbox two how do you then remove it you could hire a thousand people in some far out nation at a lesser cost than the nation that you're based in but mm. that didn't remove the pain mm. that just moved the pain from one destination to another destination so to truly remove it we thought certainly that you needed to turn it into software and any piece of software that tries to remove that certainly the way we thought about it needed a very robust data set and that data set for us was one of sitting around labeling Mm. real kind of negotiations and that labeling would be a distinct data set which we can go train a set of models on but we can go into great detail on right. kind of all the geeky parts of that fascinating i think so uh, i'm about before i go to the fun part of the conversation about talking about expert ai you have been i think one of the thing that was fascinating about your background was um, 
you have been into analytics for quite some time, churning out companies after other, and then the market is still nowhere. Like we are still not where nowhere where we should have been. What brought you to the X dot AI? Like the idea of let's fix the calendar. Like you you are very analytics guy, as you rightly said, and you have been. The world is full of pain and 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 sort of thorns. Uh, so yeah, what what brought you to X dot AI? So this is going to sound like some sort of eBay pest dispenser type story, and if people don't know about that, go look it up. And that was kind of the supposedly origin of uh, of eBay. But this is real. This is honest, and you might not believe me, but it's, it's it's true nevertheless. So having sold our prior venture, which was a predictive analytics company for news media, and we can talk about that as well. But having sold it, what happens is that you get a little bit of money in your pocket, and you get suddenly a little bit of extra time to do silly things. And one of the silly things which I did was to kind of go back into my calendar, kind of half for the fun of it, to kind of see. So, how many meetings did I do the year prior to us selling the company, raising a little bit of capital, selling some customers, hiring some good people, negotiating the exit, and all of the things that comes with just running a company. And what I found was that I did a thousand and nineteen meetings that year. A thousand and nineteen meetings. It's not the amount itself.、Mm. You're probably doing the same amount of meetings as I do, which is about four meetings a day, which is not even staggering. As in, there's salespeople who do twice the amount of meetings. There's certainly also engineers who do a tenth of that. But it's enough for where I kind of lean back, thinking, "Damn, that's a lot of pain." But how many of them ended up being rescheduled? They're not. Counted that by hand, like a poor man's analytics, and I found that 672 of those meetings got rescheduled.、Mm. So now I'm short of 2,000 meetings being negotiated, and it's not that SoftBank or any one of my other investors would have gone completely going to berserk if they found out I hired somebody to help me set up my meetings. But I'm like any other entrepreneur, a little bit stupid, a little bit too frugal. Mm. Would rather kind of invest that money into an engineer, so I did it myself, and that was kind of a catalyst to say. So if I do nothing, or if the world do nothing, and the world certainly haven't done anything since I got my first email in the very first days of the 1990s, so we're now 30 plus years in, and it didn't really change. I said the meeting I negotiated back in 1991 over my first email. That looked pretty similar to how I negotiated the last meeting in, you know, of last week. A little bit of ping pong, kind of like how we negotiated this meeting.、Mm. So that didn't change, and I just couldn't imagine. I said, "So do I just do another thirty years of this, and then I die? Is is that my life?" <laughs>、uh, and I thought that can't be right. So I brought the team back together. We spent four months kind of fooling around on the whiteboard, just kind of see. Is there an opening to kind of go create this agent? It might、mm-hmm. not be plausible, but at least let's play around on the whiteboard a little bit. So it was that thousand and nineteen meetings that was certainly kind of that very initial kind of catalyst. We'll resume after a short break. This part of the podcast is brought to you by First Friday Fair, fastest AI-powered way to find your next opportunity. Check out the website First Friday Fair. dot tao dot ai and find your next dream job. Let's get back to the podcast. Interesting. By the way,、uh, fascinating story again, and 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 big fan of Exode AI. So definitely, it's thank、uh, you. It's it's actually changing. It's as you rightly said, it's a pain. It's 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 a it's a very real pain, and it's it's stinging really hard at places that you not even imagine. So definitely, I appreciate you for for fixing that.、Uh, so now let's. If you wear your entrepreneurial hat, fixing calendar, first guy in the market, the grunt road ahead, right? They and and then that too,、um, when it requires behavioral change, when it requires the perception change. So you know that probably you will be the sucker in who who will be educating the market about this idea and and lot painful road. Now you are at, at a very comfortable position, but 
how do you sort of decide or or sort of come on board that okay i'm ready for that that pain uh, that that to educate the market and all so, so you certainly mentioned a very important thing which i would not recommend anybody trying to do hmm. and i made a bet that i didn't have to do it which was to educate the market hmm. so i simply don't think any startup really to try to educate the market as in that is an uphill battle so dramatic that not even the most likely outcome the just predicted outcome should be mm. that you don't survive it mm. you should leave any type of education to the amazons and googles and facebooks and what have you that is just an unreal endeavor doesn't mean that you can't try out new things but really truly educating a market so i think we kind of jumped into a pool for where they were not educating around our solution mm. but our solution itself that of scheduling meetings is not something that we needed to do much education about what we needed to educate about was the idea of using natural language mm. an intelligent agent given that most of what we've done up until this point so in the last 10 years most kind of applications arrived on this device as an mm. app and even that app kind of looks like a desktop application just within a smaller screen mm. so we've had decades of education on how to best use that type of ui mm. we haven't had much education on how to use the conversational ui mm. but we got the Amazon Alexa, the Google Assistant, the Microsoft Cortana, the Samsung Bixby and so on and so forth that are massively trying to educate the market on how to utilize these agents. And our bet was that we don't have to do that. They could do all the education. We can then just lean into this particular agent that schedules meetings. But the idea of knowing how to use an agent, I'm leaving that to Amazon Alexa and the 30 million people who bought it in the US and mm. the weekly emails and videos and campaigns that they run. But it's a very good observation and I would be very afraid if I end up in a place for where it is my sole responsibility to fully educate the market because it's it, it's it's extremely expensive. Interesting. And and and, and now um considering your past uh, trends of uh, curating and 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 sort of incubating analytics companies versus now Uh, a use case product on ai that's sort of engraved in everyone's day to day lives what are some of the surprises that you have got compared to your learning versus what you're seeing today i'll give you two surprises for where certainly everything we've done in the past have been really based on a pretty robust data set what i didn't fully recognize i didn't fully accept before we started was the difficulty in defining that universe mm. that we exist in in full so any agent in any capacity which you ask to kind of operate in a fully autonomous mode needs a universe which it can kind of navigate within just like a self driving car is obviously not creating a model of the real world as in that is way too complex So it's going to create a simplistic model of the world that consists of vehicles, bicycles, pedestrians, signs, and so on and so forth, but a very simple model compared to the to the real world. And once you have that definition, you'll try to kind of figure out this is what my universe consists of. How do I then get data to kind of represent that? But even just making that definition and i can give you some ideas of mm. then it's don't say the word universe when you talk mm. about scheduling meetings as in how complex can it be mm. but we're talking about intents like schedule new meeting reschedule cancel running late you're optional i'm mandatory he's the assistant he's the meeting coordinator extend the duration and so on and so forth things that can happen in my universe mm. and it sounds like something where you and me go to the whiteboard we spend a couple of hours we at 90% then tomorrow we'll meet up we'll get to 95 in a couple of weeks we'll be kind of finished we spent years literally years 
in putting this in place. We had multiple changes. And highlight that word, multiple changes. Mm. Because then I'll tell you about the second challenge and why the word multiple changes is devastating. Mm. So once you have that definition, and that is just a level of specificity that we haven't seen in any of our past ventures for where you're understanding the data, whatever you come up with on day one will hold value. On day two, if you are able to extract more value from it, oh, now I'm just uh, slightly better at what I'm doing versus yesterday. Hmm. What we have is that we might not even be able to get this to work if I can't come up with the final definition on day one. And that day one extends then into a year-long endeavor. Now, if you define this universe, you now have to somehow figure out how do I then go find a data set hmm. and label against these definitions and create a set of manuals where I can ask humans to label it, hopefully at high accuracy. I said, there's not any kind of machine learning model which you can put in place that's going to really perform better than what you've labeled. So whatever you label is the ceiling of your accuracy. And labeling that data set, which seems like, sure, just uh, get some mechanical Turks to kind of uh, hmm. highlight those uh, temporal expressions, Dennis, and uh, you're on your way. Again, hmm. I wish it was that simple. And sometimes people even talk about time without mentioning time. So they'll say, not, let's meet up Wednesday, August 2nd at 1100 hours EST. That's not how they talk. They'll say, let's meet up on my return. Hmm. But there's no temporal expression in that, but you're talking about time. So that kind of Stanford NLP library that you just downloaded and installed won't even identify that time is being talked about in this sentence. So what do you do? As in, did your definition even kind of accept the fact that that can happen in your universe? If it does not, then you, you can't support that. But what if that's how people actually communicate with each other? Can your agent then exist? Or have you created some twilight of a universe which only you exist in, but no other humans can participate in it? So that universe mm -hmm. and that labeling was just not something which I really appreciated being such a dramatic endeavor. And if you looked at some of the capital which we raised, a very large amount of that have gone into hmm. putting that data set in place. Interesting, interesting. Sorry, this is turning into a little bit of a therapy session for Dennis instead of an interview for you. <laughs> but uh, but that, that is, uh, that's, a, that's a real pain. And I think anybody who's thinking about doing anything in AI would have to at least be able to kind of answer those in the most confident of ways before they get started. Fascinating. And I think um, rightly said, um, and that's what even like, uh, even when I was, when I looked at Exhort AI and then sort of, even, even right now we're working on our startup gigs around helping people with employability being the first. So no data sets that we can use, everything else is garbage. And then you have to sort of end up creating those and it takes forever. And then I know that the second guy who's who probably come in the market would instantly get access to whatever uh, like our, our shortcomings. So that's like, yeah, it's, 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 it's a, it's a hard sort of betting to go for as an entrepreneur. And then, yeah. Yes, it is. But it could also, if you are willing to assemble it, yeah. become one of those really strong proprietary IPs hmm. that only you have. As in, nobody else sits with uh, 10 million emails hmm. in some database which they can go train a whole host of models on. I do though, so I have an opportunity to do things other people might not have an opportunity to do. But there was just a lot of pain as you suggest, yeah. which we had to go through before we get to the fun part. And it's even kind of uh, almost comical sometimes, you'll be at some meetup, You'll meet up a guy. You can see in his eyes that today is Wednesday. Tomorrow, I'll download TensorFlow. On Saturday, I'll put the whole thing in place. On Monday, I'll launch on Product Hunt. I said, now you'll download TensorFlow in nine months from now. I said, 
you don't download anything. You're going to sit and fiddle. Yeah. Sometimes for months on end, just in a spreadsheet or whatever other kind of solution that you put in place to kind of clean some data. Wow. Wow. And, and, and what do you think about, um, so you said killing the inbox, a profound yeah. statement, Google tried their hand, wave came and, and, and went uh, nowhere. What do you think, like cons looking at you from your vantage point, and you are actually, to me, one of the leading guys who actually use technology in a good way in solving the inbox problem. I, sure, in, Calendar is one of the most sort of um, uh, nuanced and some, some of the most intricate uh, module of, of my inbox life. So what's your vantage point? Like, how, what's your take? We'll resume after a short break. This part of the podcast is brought to you by First Friday Fair, fastest AI-powered way to find your next opportunity. Check out the website firstfridayfair.tao.ai and find your next dream job. Let's get back to the podcast. So I tend to say inbox versus email, and I make a distinction. Mm -hmm. So I'm a fan of email. I'm a fan of email because it's truly democratized, as in nobody owns email. You sending me an email is something for where you need mm. no permission from anybody. Hell, you can run a SMTP server in your basement mm. without any requirement from the Microsofts or the Googles or somebody else. Mm. And I like the fact that we actually do have some of those components mm. that we thought were kind of democratized information from when we started the internet. Many things have ended up in silos of late. And again, we could talk hours and end on how sad that is. Email is not one of them. Email survived. Mm -hmm. So I'm not out to kill email. I think email is a wonderful protocol, mm -hmm. primarily for the reasons I just described. Mm -hmm. The inbox, though, which is where your email arrive, can for some people be a little bit stressful and i put that politely i think and probably even more so if you're a guy like me who runs inbox zero so i leave most days mm, wow. on inbox zero as in when i leave tonight i have no more email and there's all sorts of reasons for that and you can call me silly but i actually think there's a lot of value in it so it's not really one of killing email it's one of being able to control that flow going on in your inbox. And just as a side note to you kind of mentioning Wave, Wave from Google, if people remember it, mm. was a try to kill email. And I think that was the wrong approach. There's nothing wrong with the protocol. If anything, I'm kind of happy that they didn't succeed because then we would now have been at the mercy of a protocol which they owned and operated which was not fully democratized. Sure, there would be kind of APIs into it and what have you, but you and me wouldn't own it. As in, the world wouldn't be able to kind of gain access and do things that they wanted it to do. So I'm happy they failed for that reason. The inbox, though, don't, if you want to kind of master it, hmm. don't think of it as in, it all needs to disappear. Think of it as in, there's a set of chores that arrive in my inbox that I would rather be without. And there's plenty of chores in that inbox. And I think many of them shouldn't really be a human task, but we shouldn't forget that's also, and there was a time as in, I remember, I look forward to kind of open my inbox in the morning, back when I would get one or two emails a day. As in, there was a time for where getting an email was kind of romantic. I said, ooh, could be a new customer, could be from my friend in Germany, could be many things. But you could get back to that if you could just remove all the chores. Mm. So having your receipts reimbursed, planning that trip to Miami, setting up that meeting with that kind of prospect for early next week, there's plenty of little chores. And I think instead of having these kind of very grand ambitions, just uh, look at a set of entrepreneurs like me for where, hey, I'm going to pick just a small slice of the inbox. Hmm. If I can remove that for where anybody emailing you saying, hey, great kind of uh, conversation you had. Do you got time to meet up for a diet coke? Because I'm going to be in Manhattan first week of September. When I look at that email, 
the first thing I'll decide is, oh, he looks kind of clever. We should meet up. That takes me a split second. Once I figure that out, and for there's no pain, I just do want to read that email. As in, any exciting person who want to meet up with me, time well spent. Mm. Now I have to schedule it, though. Oh, that's the chore. Let me just CC in my agent. Hey, Amy, set something up at my office on 200 Broadway, first week of September. Send archive. It is not my job anymore. So that's how I think we should attack the inbox. And we should never forget that it's not email we're trying to kill. It's all those little chores. And I would love if there was a set of people behind me who kind of join me in this fight. Go find the next set of things that if you look at that inbox from today that you'd rather not do, which if you could ask your colleague next to you, if he could do it for you, that's right for an AI to kind of go do. Interesting. And, and so when you talk about inbox, so I think what, what I'm hearing is all the getting things done thingy uh, are sort of ripe for where the, all the chores that I, I hate doing. What Those are ripe market. So how do you sort of then um, as an entrepreneur decide that, hey, calendar, let me start with the calendar first. Or like what's, what's your, what that mindset that you've gone through? There's certainly plenty of things that are solvable from a technical point of view, but have very little commercial value. Mm. And there's perhaps reasons for why you should still solve them, but that's probably not the job of the entrepreneur. Mm. What we certainly found was that the pain embedded into that of setting up meetings and the value of those meetings being on your calendar were of real commercial value. And there was multiple proof points. The first proof points was that if people couldn't afford it, they would actually hire a human to do it. As in they would in Manhattan spend the $60,000 mm. to put some human in place. They would do plenty of other things, but they would also sit and manage their calendar. That's a very good proof point that some people see this as perhaps even a luxury, but only a luxury that the very few can afford. So the fact that we were able to confirm that there was real commercial value mm. in this particular technology, if we solved it, was, I think, enough for us to kind of jump into the pool and certainly we become way more nuanced on exactly who do we serve, who do we serve best, who do we serve best now, who could we serve better in the future, what particular features do you need if you're a recruiter versus a salesperson versus an executive versus an engineer. And that's all the kind of little details that comes along with it. But there was never really any doubt about the fact that if you're a knowledge worker, as in if you go into an office today and you touch a computer in some way, shape or form, you have a calendar, as in the mm. company provided you a calendar. Could be Google Calendar, could be Outlook, could be anything, doesn't really matter. And in that calendar, you have events. Even if you're the most hardcore back-end infrastructure engineer who hates meetings, you still have them, as in you still attend the all hands, you still have to do kind of the weekly stand-up, you still have to do a certain number of things to be able to communicate with your colleagues. You might be in a place for where you say you don't do meetings, but you do. Mm -hmm. Even walking up to the whiteboard and spending 15 minutes with a colleague, that's a meeting. It might just be so informal and so well gelled in your organization you, that you don't think of it as a meeting. But it is. It happens. And that was uh, all good signs for it being a kind of commercially viable endeavor interesting so um i have a question but I, I'll, I'll get to that uh, slightly later so i want to before i go to that what i'm curious now let's talk about google duplex i think what do you think i want you i want you to take on that what what do you think about it? just uh, taking a couple of steps back hmm. to just a better comment on it i think it's perhaps important for people to make a clear distinction between the UI and the reasoning or intelligence, if you want to use a word that dramatic. And on the UI end, I'm 
old enough to have taken most of my CS degree on the command line. Mm. And the command line interface was the primary interface to any form of compute a good 30 years ago. Then we had the graphical user interface, Windows, Mac OS, so on and so forth. And that kind of semi-democratized access to compute. Anybody in any office with very little education could start using word processors and spreadsheets and what have you. And that's certainly a distinct UI in its own right. Then the smartphone arrived, and we can talk about whether the app is a distinct UI or certainly a graphical UI compressed so dramatically that we had to design specifically for the smartphone. There were also kind of sensors included into this particular UI for where you could now do new things that you really couldn't do on the desktop. So that was a paradigm for where we trained a lot of people and are close to giving access to almost everybody who can figure out how to use a smartphone UI. Mm. Then over the last, let's call it three, four, five years perhaps, we've seen the beginning of a new UI. And perhaps this is only the fourth UI in really all of compute. And it doesn't matter whether you will define it as three or whether you define it as five, but the conversational UI is a distinct UI. Mm. But it's just a UI. So I'm not talking about intelligence here or AI. I'm talking about how do you design for a UI for where it's delivered in natural language. And natural language can be written out and it can arrive as an email in your inbox. It can be voiced and come as a sample on your Alexa or through the Google Assistant. But it's the conversational UI. Now, within the conversational UI, mm. you'll see multiple applications. And I think perhaps the best way to kind of make a distinction is the bot and the agent. And I'm not even sure that those will be the two monikers that will stick, but the bot is the kind of question answer machine mm. for where you ask the bot, what's the time in Singapore? It'll give you an answer. And it kind of looks like a search result almost or at least the instant answers you know from Google. That is really the conversational UI. You ask a question and it writes back to you, mm. not in a set of links and you visit a website. No, just writes an answer back to you. Mm. Or you ask Siri out loud and it will kind of speak to you out loud, but there's really no difference between those two. So knowing that, the first thing people should at least separate from or take away from the duplex demo is the con conversational UI part as in, mm. oh, they have an agent that can speak. Mm. Good for them. That we've had for years on end. But what they did extremely well was the text to speech mm. sampling. Again, that's nothing to do with intelligence or ability to reason with another human being. That is an ability to take a text string and turn it into a sample that sounds like a human. And what they've done versus what most people have done up until this point is craft a technology which I believe they call WaveNet. Mm. So many times, certainly in the past, what we've done is that we've had pretty large snippets of samples sounding out sometimes full-on words, sometimes even sentences, as saying you're looking for the word 11 and you have a sample for 11. What they've done is that they've cut that down to tiny snippets that are really just waves mm. because anything which I say is definitely an audio wave and they've been able to put those together and that made the samples extremely natural. Actually, so natural that the way that they've assembled them, they ended up including all of these little ticks mm. that we have as humans. Like, hmm, uh, those sounds, but again, that's a text to sample technology. Mm. But the better, you, the better that technology is, the more people who are not in tech will assume that 
intelligence embedded into it. No, that's not the case. The case is just that they're really good at that, and it sounds extremely human. And when you're not in tech and you, you see something or hear something that just kind of feels human, you immediately assume it's now also got human intelligence. But mm. That's a separate challenge. So have that in mind. Now, there's a set of intelligence or ability to reason with the human where they've gone down the path of the, let's call it single model. This is probably completely unfair and I have no direct insight into uh, what they've done, but they certainly alluded to that in their own blog posts that some neural net of some form was put in place and they can now kind of take some sort of inputs and provide some sort of output to that. That does not necessarily suggest strong ability to reason. Mm. So if you think about any agent, you really have three challenges here. You have some sort of natural language, natural language understanding challenge. If you do understand what is being talked about, you have some sort of reasoning challenge for where, oh, you're running late, but what do I do with that? If you can then reason and take a set of actions, that brings us back to where we started, which needs to be within your well-defined universe. You need to take that computational outcome and turn it into text again, so some sort of NLG. I'm not sure I was overly impressed with their ability to reason or that I really think that they can reason well. And that's also why you see that they can only really book appointments for hairdressers or book a table at a restaurant or something that kind of rhymes with that. Which are, mm. Certainly, I operate in a small universe. They operate in a tiny universe in these one-on-one -on -one fixed kind of time sets. So that is something for where we'll have to kind of wait and see what they provide. What they should get a ton of credit for, though, is their kind of text to audio. That was out of this world. Awesome. And I'm, as a technologist, truly impressed. Interesting. And, and when, when, when I'm I, I, sorry, I'm stealing no, your it's, time. It's, it's, I think exactly what I wanted. So I think I, I do appreciate you on that. So when I hear about that, right, and, and I, I'm, I'm wearing my data scientist hat on that. And what I was looking for is a human modem uh, emerging. So a, a duplex on both the sides, right, trying to negotiate a time. Now, why, why are they even talking? They don't, need to need, they don't need to talk. They have a better way to communicate, right? So they can just exchange their bits and, and, and figure out a best optimal time. So now, um, if, if we Pause. look at... Yes. Can, can I interject? Because yes. you actually bring up a really exciting point here. And sorry to kind of interrupt you. It's just that yes. that is not immediately clear to everybody because I right. can certainly imagine, again, non-technologists just assume that, say, when Amy meets Amy, so mm. I use Amy, so you also use Amy. Oh, mm. then Amy is just kind of emailing back and forth. Right. That seems not right. The only reason that we're using natural language is that some of the agents are human. I said, I don't understand a machine language. So you need to kind of write in a language which I understand. Right. So that's why we're doing that part, which is also uh, why you'll see self-driving cars take in really human-like imagery mm. because they exist now in a world where other humans also drive right. with all of the unpredictability that comes along with that. But there comes a day where if all the cars are machines, yeah. I can just ask the other car, are you stopping? And if you're not, I certainly will. And when we meet another Amy, to kind of bring it back to that, we don't email back and forth. So she will simply do some sort of internal language, some sort of internal type of preference negotiation in her machine language. And conceptually, you know, in the wildest version of success for where they're all Amy's, there will be no natural language. As in, mm. that part of the challenge will just disappear. Nobody, nobody speaks to any assistants. It'll just be, hey, you email me. Dennis, I'm gonna be in Manhattan. We should meet up for a Diet Coke uh, first week of December when I'm here. I see the Amy's can help uh, put it in place. I rely back saying, yeah, we should. Amy on my end, I'm going to hash out with your Amy. As I click send, hmm. at machine speeds, she'll solve it, and it's right. already on the calendar. Oh, December 4th, 1,300 hours, 
200 Broadway, great. And then language just disappears and you can start to do things that are just extremely uh, interesting. What kind of network optimization and so on and so forth. Fascinating. Sorry, I had to interject. Yes, it's, I think that's that's, that was exactly what, it, what, what the buildup was. I exactly wanted to sort of go over how will both this world interact if both of them are Amy. And I think I, I do appreciate you sharing that. So now let's spend a few minutes on the future of work and what... So if any real Amy is watching this, what would you tell her? Here's a fact, and that is not to belittle what might happen in the future. I'm way more optimistic than uh, most people, but I can certainly appreciate the worry or certainly appreciate the willingness to investigate whether there'll be any harm because we should plan for it then. But for most AIs that attack a job hmm. that exists today, you'll see two types. You'll have the type for where it was a job that was only available to the select few. So nobody's losing any jobs here. Mm. There's just a lot more people who can get access to something that they would otherwise not be able to get access to. So I'm in that category. I'll give you just some stats here. There's a little bit above 10 billion formal meetings being set up in the US alone every year. And less than 0.1% of those meetings are being set up by admin staff. Mm. As in, nobody really have an admin setting up a meeting. Sure, you and me might have seen an admin because I live in Manhattan or I speak to people in finance or I'm somehow exposed to it, but in the real world, they don't exist. Mm. As in, if I even choose to just say, all of the real life Amy's, do what you do. Mm. I don't even want to kind of take your work. And by the way, we are not targeting anybody who's got a human assistant. As in, you won the corporate lottery. Good for you. I'm telling you the 99.9% .9 of other people, me, you, who are just on our own. So I'm in the category for where we are now just democratizing access to a past luxury. That doesn't suggest that there's not other AIs that wouldn't more aggressively attack a job for where that's not a luxury. That's millions of people employed to do that particular task, say driving trucks around the US by any estimate, perhaps five some million people being in a function that kind of rhymes with that. Mm. When that self-driving truck arrives, what do we do? Mm. My optimism then is not one for where I suggest they should keep their truck driving jobs, but it's just one for where why would we this one time stop having lust for more as consumers? So whenever you and me get something as consumers, we get used to it and then we want more. So here's a silly example, but you know, it's the best one I can come up with on the fly. So I get all my groceries from some online grocer on Long Island that drive it into Manhattan. So it comes to my lobby. It could also go to the 19th floor. It could also go to my kitchen. It could also go to my fridge. It could also be unpacked. There could be many things that comes along with that. But right now, the majority of the cost is just getting it from, or packaging it and getting it from Long Island to Manhattan. If that turns out to be the cheap part because we got self-driving trucks, Preston, hmm. I want more. Right. Not me, but consumers now want more. And there was a time for plenty of what you and me do on technology. Hey, even this call here, by the way, mm. that used to be a luxury, by the way. Mm. You and me don't see this as a luxury where we should keep it at 20 minutes. Right. No, we just uh, really, we do a full on hour here because you and me talking over long distance, that's not a luxury. Yeah. It's kind of just free, isn't it? As if I'm not even sure, am I paying for this? Probably not. So we should just assume that everything that we've seen in the past, which is that once something ends up being cheap or cost next to nothing, the consumer will ask, 
for something on top of that. Interesting. That's my optimism. Interesting. I think that's so the capitalist inside me believing so much in capitalism that it will solve itself. I th- I think you're spot on. So so whenever we ask this question because we are disrupting that that truck driver analogy, right? So we want to ensure that truck driver have a job once once the truck driver trucks are um, um, autonomous. So when we ask this, I think and we, we did a research on when we we're doing some soul searching on whether this is a good intention or whatever, right? So I I I ran this um, report on uh, when the initial cars came. They used to use a lot of lumber. And the cart used less lumber. So the whole world get brouhaha that we'll be out of lumber and there'll be no more houses, no more lumber jobs, blah, blah, blah. And then now we have a market for palladium using in car. Like we have the entire industry shaped. Then we have, when we have the hard drives, there was a brouhaha on, hey, no, you can't take a hard drive inside. When Seagate came with this idea of, hey, we can store things on this this portable thing, the world went brouhaha that no, 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 things would and, and all the reports, and I think recently I, I read this report from McKinsey. So McKinsey was asked, hey, look at the cell phone. Uh, I, I think AT&T asked them, how do you think, like, and, and back, that's I think back in 1980s, that what do you think I would be able to sell by 2000? And they came up with like 900,000. And there was like, it was 120 million. So and these <laughs> are like smart folks. At, so yeah. So from that perspective, I think all I, you're, you're spot on. The more it will unravel, that's that's I think that we should be sort of in caps understanding that what and be ready for that for sure. So with that, um, uh, Dennis, thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, I know I know you need to go. So I I, I really have, uh, want your thoughts on like two two more things. So first, thank you so much for sp- uh, uh, spending your time with us. Uh, it was beautiful. Uh, we learned a lot about AI. We learned a lot about how uh, future of work is impacting with AI. What what tomorrow's Amy should understand from what's going on with the technology disruption. It's important and then they should keep an eye on that. And and also um, we ask all of our guests to share uh, some books that they read, uh, some of the books that, that you have read. I could do the usual, recommend the books that I almost know with high certainty that people have read and me aligning to those books will make me uh, seem sane. So you all read uh, the hard thing about hard things or from zero to one and so on and so forth. And they're all good books and I've certainly read them and you should all kind of go reread them. But there's no fun in that. Yes. I'll give you uh, three books that I will assume none of you have read. And I want you to read them not just for what they're saying outright, but for why, what might be in between the lines. Mm. So the first book I will recommend is The Narrow Road by Felix Dennis. Mm-hmm. It's about this British entrepreneur in the magazine business who is extremely rude, lived the life not very honorable and most of what he's got to say you should uh, just not do you should be a better person than that but the one takeaway from that book is the value of your equity read the book and walk away with a slightly different perspective on the value of your equity and if you're in startup as a founder first employee beginning team, really figure out how to value that equity. It's a good book to remind you, not for me to say, go value your equity. Mm. You couldn't care less. That funny Danish dude. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Next book would be the autobiography of Mike Tyson. Again, Dennis, why do I need to read this? Mm. It's probably vile human being or certainly were not a role model to anybody in his uh, younger days, a uh, athlete uh, that certainly succeeded uh, in the few minutes he was uh, in the ring. But read that book to truly figure out who to trust. Mm. Because if you make that amount of money that quick, 
in a place for where there's probably not many you can trust, mm. that sometimes rhymes with what happens in startup where you go from nothing to a lot, and sometimes a lot can just be in your world. $100,000 can be a lot of money, a million dollars can be a lot of money, $100 million is a lot of money. Mm. So that's a good book to remind you, at least to come up with ideas for who to trust. Mm. Then the last book I would suggest is Shoe Dog, which is the founder mm. of Nike. And again, you can read it for the story that it is, mm. the founding of Nike, and it's a lovely book, and you'll spend the three hours on Friday night. And I like it. But you might want to read it. And then once done, really think about what do I need to sacrifice? Mm. And am I willing to sacrifice that if I should end up being so lucky to get the opening to build something at the scale of Nike? or even a tenth of that. And if you read the book, you'll certainly know that he sacrificed everything. It doesn't say that, but when you get to the end, in the very last few pages, you feel the remorse, perhaps even some inclination of him not knowing whether it was worth it. So those are three books. The narrow road collection. by Felix Dennis, the bio of Mike Tyson, and Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. Beautiful. And and so now we're at the last last uh, question of the conversation. So if you want our listeners and viewers to take away from this something from this conversation, like what would you uh, want our listeners and viewers to take away? I want you to look at me now and focus. You should uh, <laughs> immediately go to x.ai the website not just because i want to sell you something i want to sell you something as well i'm an entrepreneur like anybody else but i want you to go there if what you've seen up until this point have been kind of stories in the press commentary here and there a good article of medium and they're all great input but you haven't really touched ai just yet i said it's not tangible and there's plenty of good AI for where you can't touch it because it's in a different setting for where you as an individual can't be exposed to it. Amy at X.AI or Andrew at X.AI are extremely tangible. And you can actually try out AI and mm -hmm. kind of make up your own opinion about where we're at today. And I'm certainly not suggesting we are perfect, but I certainly think we are perfect for you to get exposed to it, try it around and set up a meeting and see what does this feel like? And if this works, what might the world might look like if I get another 15 agents to work for me in other capacities? That will be my uh, one ask. And it is a little bit self-serving. <laughs> I am fully aware. So with that, um, thank you so much, Dennis. And to our listeners and viewers, we'll put in some code uh, that they'll be able to use to access Amy um, or Andrew. Um, and with that, uh, Dennis, again, thank you so much for being very generous with your time walking us through your journey, helping us understand uh, what it takes to build up an AI startup and helping us understand where the future is and uh, how, how to sort of navigate to that. And you're always welcome back on the podcast, by the way. So uh, again, thank you so much for your time. We will do this again later. Time well spent. And thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much. So... Uh, I thought I was sick of home, but actually I was homesick Never really knew that I would have to grow up so quick I'm so uncomfortable, don't know anybody here Just a couple dudes that I met once, that's it, that's it. And I go into the booth feeling nervous Got butterflies in my stomach like I'm so worthless Is the mic on? I don't know how to work this Inside I'm breaking down, I hope I'm not up on the side